Well, it's good to see you. Good to see you too. Good to see you too. I've been so excited to have somebody to talk about Kristen with. Because I just there's I just haven't seen anything out there. It's wild. It's, <laughs> it's weird, and I don't know if it's because there's tons in Norwegian, and if you're a Kristen scholar, yeah. you learn Norwegian to read the scholarship. I don't I don't know, but it is weird that there isn't more in English because it seems like. It seems well, like enough people have read the book and consider it to be like at the top yeah. <laughs> that it's just weird that there's nothing written. So yeah. and that's the thing. So I just read the opening of this book. So I, literally, I haven't even gotten out of the foreword. Um, I started it last night. But what was interesting, do you know who Andrew Little is? Mm -mm. Okay. So he's one of the 12 Southerners that were part of like the fugitive poets back in the okay. 19th like that whole group and he was one of them um he taught this novel he replaced war and peace with this novel in his syllabus starting in the 1970s that's so interesting so i mean where did it go <laughs> it's yeah. just, right i it, think that i didn't hear about it until um tina nunnally's translation came out and i guess that was the 90s but i have the other one that's the first one i read and it was awful yeah <laughs> And that's what, whenever people contact me and they're like, I started Kristen Lovren's daughter and you said it was really good, but I'm not sure. I'm like, hold up, which <laughs> translation are you reading? And almost always it's the old one. Yeah. So how did you find out about it? I actually read it when I was maybe 15 years old. No. Um, are you yeah. serious? Yeah. For the first time, but I didn't get, I didn't get it obviously mm -hmm. at that point. And I was like, okay, so the moral of the story is don't get knocked up before marriage. <laughs> that was like what I took away from it. <laughs> um, and then I read it again, maybe, was it maybe after college? I read it again. But, but how, at 15, how on earth did you get introduced to it? I think that my parents heard about it from Mars Hill Audio because they were really into Mars Hill Audio. Yeah. And they were like, there's this cool book that just got retranslated. We should buy it for our daughter, all three, all three um, books in this saga. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, that's really cool. And so then what made you return to it just because you remembered it being a good book? I don't even know. I don't know what made me return to it. Um, I think that I remembered not loving it mm -hmm. and wanting to see, I think I just wanted to see like, oh, is it going to be the same if I read it now? Because I've heard good things about it. And maybe I didn't really grasp it at 15, if you can imagine that <laughs> happening. Um, and then when I started again, I loved it. Yeah. So did you read it the next time through as a mom? I think I read it the next time through as a mom. And then my husband read it because a lot of times we'll read books and then suggest mm -hmm. them to each other. And he loved it. And then I've read it a couple of times since then. So I think I've read it four times total, but only yeah. three times as not a teen. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just, I find it fascinating when men love it. So, I mean, Andrew Little is, is loving this book it's so much that he wants to read it over and over again, because to me, it just strikes me. I guess it has the spirituality of Brothers Karamazov, and I'm not a guy, and I can read Brothers K and really get mm -hmm. into the spiritual element. But this book really, it almost demands that you have kind of the same visceral experiences of Kristen with motherhood. Yeah, I well, I think the thing about it is it does what it does with a female protagonist what so much of literature mm -hmm. does with male protagonists. It's just finally. Yeah. You get a female protagonist that is that nuanced and complicated and interesting as the male protagonists that are everywhere in literature. I think that's what it is. And so I don't think that it should be off-putting to men or I, I don't think it should be any harder for them to read Kristen than it is for me to read Brideshead Revisited. Right. You know, like her desires um, are so universal. Is that mm -hmm. why? Yes. Um and I really think, and I am, I am a Jane Austen nut, but Kristen, I think is the best female protagonist I've ever read. I mean, I just, I can't think of anybody who could challenge her 
for that position. So for all the people who are out there who are like, oh my gosh, I love Jane Austen. What how did you think? <laughs> okay, so what is it about Kristen? Because I feel the same way. What is it about Kristen that beats out Jane Austen, which is so hard to say out loud? Yeah, I think that part of it is the epic nature of the saga where you meet her as a little girl and you are with her almost womb to tomb. Mm -hmm. And so I think that is part of it. You're not just getting this little piece of maidenhood to the altar yeah as you get in Jane Austen and you're getting a lot more of her grief and so it just dives deeper mm -hmm. into who she is and maybe you know I think the world of Jane Austen I think she could do something like that because her characters are so interesting and you really understand the way their minds works and what their motivations are in this very intricate way. But I think the nature of the kind of book that Kristen Lovren's daughter is mm -hmm. just allows a very different experience that's even more intimate. Well, and I was thinking the spirituality, the, mm -hmm. the two planes of this novel are very different mm -hmm. from Austen. So yeah. when people ask me, they ask me to compare Dostoevsky and Tolstoy a lot. Like, why would I choose one over the other? And for me, it's a lot like comparing Jane Austen. Jane Austen and Tolstoy are so similar. They're the world of manners. They are on this plane. There is good and evil, but you don't see it or feel it in the sense of, hey, there's this troll maiden that's like offering her a golden wreath. <laughs> like, you better pray to St. Christina if you are going to get out of this situation. There seems to be like the same kind of second world or invisible world that is drawn into this reality in a way that you have in Brothers Karamazov or for me, like Flannery O'Connor. I, for some reason, <laughs> this is weird, but for some reason, Kristen Lovren's daughter as a character reminds me of the way I feel about Don Draper as a character in Mad Men. Have you seen Mad Men? Okay. So the last time that you and I talked was your podcast two years ago or maybe two and a half years ago. And uh -huh. you have Don Draper too. <laughs> Yes. Like something about how you are watching this story unfold and you're so connected to this character, but you're also so mad at them for most of the story. You're so frustrated. You're so irritated with them. You see exactly where these, their actions are going to lead them and you don't want them to go there. And you know, they're in for a world of hurt and they're hurting other people. And then it keeps hitting you over and over again. Like, oh no, Kristen is me. Oh no, Don Draper is me. You know, it's just, mm -hmm. it's the human experience. Yeah. And um, I think it's, I think it's a line in Kristen Lovren's daughter where it's, she says, my life is this journey of having the opportunity to reach for God and constantly choosing my own path instead. Yeah. Yeah. So she says, uh, all my life I've wanted both the errant path. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. God. Yeah. The, the desire for both roads and you can't mm -hmm. have, you can't have it. Yeah. I wondered too. So Flannery O'Connor said, um, she loved Kristen Lovren's daughter, but she said, do you think you could still write Kristen Lovren's daughter if you didn't set it in the 14th century? Mm. And I, I just don't know that you, could have the same story because the the idea of sin is so mm -hmm. thick with Kristen. Like she, you don't have to convince her sin exists, right? Mm -hmm. So most of O'Connor's characters, you have to convince them sin exists. And that's the whole goal of the author. She's trying to convince the reader and the character that like sin is real. Uh -huh. Kristen feels it so intensely every time that she sins. Mm -hmm. You know, she knows that she has that kind of tension that that Christians have, but sometimes we're, we become immune to in our culture because our culture just downplays sin so much. And I think that the connection in Christian setting between mm -hmm. the spiritual realm and the realm of how things are done, you know, like what is honorable to your family and what's kind of the moral code of the society is mm -hmm. still so entrenched with the Christian world. And so the idea of like my family's honor would be diminished by my sin. Like that doesn't make sense to us. It doesn't. I no. don't think it could translate. 
No, because we, I mean, at this point, at least we belong to ourselves. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and, and that's why when we're reading this and Kristen says like, uh, who does she say to Fru Osheld, where she says, even like, I didn't realize the consequences of sin were that you had to trample on other people. But even now I would choose Ireland and trample on my own father. And it's like this gut moment of like, what? what like how could you do that and yet how many like you said the recognition of sin in yourself like how many times mm-hmm. did i choose my own sin and trample on the people i love mm-hmm. I cared more about myself and things that i wanted which is an image of what sin really always is you know there's no such thing as a personal sin like all sin hurts <sighs> the community yeah. and so i think in Kristen, you see that you see how Erlen's sin hurts Kristen and how Kristen's sin hurts Lovren's and that it's all connected. I just was looking through my copy and I had, I am so terrible and I dog ear pages of things I like. I don't know if that's allowed, if we can talk about that. But people are like, oh my gosh, how can you dog ear pages? But I dog eared the page where it's the last time that Kristen sees Lovren's. Oh. And they're like saying goodbye and she's just like overcome with remorse yeah. and it's so painful. Like I was just in my living room, like the kids were playing and I was just like, tears were rolling down my cheeks and I just like jumped in like right there and read two pages and I was like done for. I've got goosebumps with you talking about it because I, I feel the same thing. It, it feels so close to home when she describes mm-hmm. these things or even Erland, I mean, I, I guess we're giving away spoilers, but when Erland's about to die and this time having read it through a second time, it's like, oh, I know he's about to die. And she's yelling at him. Like, why are you yelling at yeah. him? Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's so, it's so good because there's no, I mean, almost there's, it's like, there's no villains. Like yeah. Erland in some ways, like he, he's villainous in some ways, but he's not though. Like he's a Don Draper. Like he's, he's not thinking about it that way. And he's just weak. You know, he's not malicious. And so as I, I feel like as I read it, I am less taken in by him Mm -hmm. because I'm like, I know what you're about Erland, but then also I'm like more compassionate towards him each time I read it. Um, so I think that's what's interesting is there's no perfect people and there's not really villains, yeah. but it's like the war within the soul of each different character. Someone asked me today about good literature um, and they were asking, well, how do you know what good literature is? And I use that C.S. Lewis idea that it's, it's what good reading, like it makes you a good reader, right? Like if you're able to attend to it. Um, but I think you're bringing up another point that makes this good literature and and that is that there are no there are no good guys and there are no bad guys in this narrative. Like even I'm trying to think the worst person I can think of is Moon on. Like he's probably yeah. the person I hate the most in the whole narrative. But she even names her kid after him. Mm-hmm. Like there's some sort of redemption. And by the time you see him, and this is the trajectory you're talking about, like seeing a whole life, by the time you get to him in his old age, he just seems kind of pitiful. He doesn't mm-hmm. have the same vitriol that he had earlier in the narrative, right? Yeah, and even, um, what is her name? Is it Elaine, Elaine Orm's daughter? Like, you feel bad for her. Her situation is terrible. I mean, she's terrible, but also her situation is terrible and you feel bad. Like every single character is a real, is like a real person to me. You just hit on something there too, talking about everyone becoming real when you get to see their whole life played out. Mm Mm-hmm only something literature can do for you Mm -hmm. as opposed to just that one moment that you get to see someone in right and in that one moment you judge their action you can almost like distance yourself from it but when you go from Kristen being a little girl to being kind of a useless 60 year old right Mm -hmm. that's how she feels and realizes that's who she is at the end and you get to see everything within this narrative in a way that we can't see our own lives. Like we can't see our own biography. Like how does my stories of seven-year-old me, how does that play out? What, am, what, are, what are my stories mm-hmm. that are telling when I'm 60? Do I want to have Kristen's story, mm-hmm. as, right? To look back on. 
Yeah. And mm-hmm. yet, like, all of her wandering, she mm-hmm. gets to where she needs to go in the most roundabout way, but she gets there. You know, the, the end is one of the most satisfying endings of any book I've ever read. Yeah. It's and so good. I think, do you think, do you think that's part because the way that Providence is kind of writing her story? I mean, Erland tells mm-hmm. her, not Erland, Brother Edvin tells her at the beginning that the Lord is after her, right? I mean, the, in, a, mm-hmm. in a beautiful way um, that she is always going to feel this love and desire for him. And there's nowhere she can go that he's not going to be with her. And then even got, like, there's these are repeated scenes where you know that God's writing a story despite her will and despite her hard heartedness. Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. I think that, well, there's also this um, almost like up the mountain of purgatory kind of motion to her life where like, she keeps turning again and again. And like, there's this conversion, like her life is a life of conversion. So she's constantly turning again and she's doing the pilgrimage and she is contrite and she's reaching out for God's mercy. And then she's talking, you know, she's talking to a priest and pouring out her heart and say, like, I know I've been wrong here. I'm, I'm struggling so much that I'm not even sorry or, you know, but she's still reaching out over and over and over again. And she keeps messing up. And so it's annoying because you're like, Kristen, like get it together, like do it right this time. But it's, it's her whole life. It's like her life's work is this conversion little bit by little bit until the end. Um, and I think you're exactly right that the, um, the theme of God's providential grace following her everywhere she goes through her life, that that's like, that's what it talks about in the end where she's realizing, she says like every half said prayer, like every little bit tiny crack that I opened my heart to God. He was pouring his grace in, like he was reaching in over and over so that he was stamped upon my soul. And I didn't even know, but it was there all along. And it's so beautiful. See the image of the ring. She takes off her ring and the inside had an M for Our Lady, for Mary. And when she takes off her ring, it's still imprinted on her skin. And she realizes that's like my soul has been stamped with God and I, it was hidden from even me, but now here we are. I mean, it's just so, it's so good. It's so good. Oh, you gave me goosebumps again. And what you said about conversion, I think is so good for people to hear because I think our entire culture is telling everyone that you have to be on this upward mobility, like this mm-hmm. act of progress. And so people who are real, <laughs> who have sin, and it's like, why do I keep yelling at my children? Why do I keep snapping at my husband? Why do I keep making choices that are about money and not good things or like whatever it is, you get frustrated with your own sinfulness Mm -hmm. playing on repeat. But if you can instead visualize it through the eyes of this novel, that it's not just this going backwards and then a step forward and then backwards. Instead, it's a turning and converting. Mm -hmm can also be like a purgatorial ascent. Ah, oh, that's a great way of viewing our life. And, yeah. and what is moving us upward, even when it feels like all we're doing is repeating our same sins. Yes, yes. And like, as a Catholic, I have to take the same sins to confession all the time. And it's so annoying, because you're like, why did I do this again? I confessed this last week, you know, but it's just that turning, that constant turning. Okay, I screwed up again. I'm going to turn to God again. And when I mess up again, I'm going to turn to God again. And it's this slow, slow, slow progress. that feels like you're not even going anywhere. But then you look back and you're like, oh, God's grace has been working on my heart. Um, But I I can't see it day to day. I can't see it week to week. But this turning back is moving me or I'm being moved by it, maybe. Um, Which is why you have to read novels that are like this that kind of give us more of the total vision of things Mm -hmm. so locked in our isolated like smaller vision of things Mm -hmm. right and and that her mistakes which were pretty massive (laughs) her mistakes had massive consequences but they weren't that was not the sum of her identity i mean it's like that um 
I think it's Pope St. John Paul II who says, we are not the sum of our failures, but we are the sum of our father's love for us. And like her, her mistakes, in some ways, it's like, gosh, Christian, you just ruined your life. Like, why do you keep ruining your life? But in some ways, like it, it doesn't. Like she turned back and Lovrens and Rongfrid turned back and and Simon, like, oh gosh, I love Simon so much. And like in his last moments, yeah. he was choosing to love God and to love her more than himself by staying silent, yeah. you know, by not telling her that he's loved her. And yeah. it was just so, it was so beautiful. Like, even though her actions hurt him, that moment was so redemptive, drawing him like through his suffering, he became a holy man. So it's like, there's this other layer to all of her mistakes. Yeah. I'm sure you know this because you study Kristen Lovren's daughter, but did you know that Unset doesn't become a Catholic till after this? Yes, which is so wild, but also like, how could you write this book and not be like, okay, sign me up. I guess I just wrote the best Catholic story that's ever been written. Like, it's just wild. But I did, I did read that the practice of writing this story, like moved her along in, I mean, how could it, how could it not? Have you read Gunner's Daughter? No, I heard your podcast. It's short. It's really short. Um, like it would take you a couple of hours to read it. Um, but it is fun to read next to Kristen because it's kind of the pre-Christian Hmm. It kind of mirrors in some ways, but is totally different in other ways. Um, hmm. But it would be a fun, just quick read to compare Kristen to. And then there's this little tidbit. I think it's just a footnote. I haven't read it in a couple of years, but I think it's just a footnote from Unset that explains that the graveyard where the protagonist of Gunnar's daughter is buried is a graveyard that later Kristen Lovren's daughter oh. would have been familiar with. Like it would have, they would have crossed paths, yeah. even though they're, you know, a few hundred years apart. In, in your email, you said, oh, I want to talk about Kristen. It's like in her physical body, how that plays into her identity. And like, is there any other book that communicates what it is like to be like a have a physical body of a mother or like a pregnant woman and a nursing mother and postpartum. Like, I don't know of any other book like this. No. And especially not, not fiction like this. I was thinking, um, Oh, I don't even know if I can't, I have too many books in my office. Um, but <laughs> I was thinking about that and that's what I'm actually writing on because I've been meditating so much over the last year about knowing God in his feminine metaphors. Mm -hmm. Right. So when God calls himself a laboring mother, that he's panting and gasping in Isaiah to bring us salvation. Mm -hmm. right? Or when God talks about himself as, as the nursing mother, mm -hmm. or even Paul talks about himself as a nursing mother, like longing to be gentle with the Thessalonians and they refuse it. Um, and how reading this novel, because she's able to understand her body as like this conduit of holiness as well as a conduit to other things. I mean, she has to really understand like where she turns her body or how she uses it in the same way. If we imagine those metaphors for God and her experience, how much mm -hmm. it touches the experience of, of knowing God and, and knowing what holiness can be like that we can even see these things in our own lives, at least as mothers, like God labors for me like that. I remember that experience. Mm -hmm. Like God's laboring like that for me. I don't know. It's, it's something we don't draw enough on in the mm -hmm. church. I think that's a great point. I was just thinking about where's the verse where it says, even, um, even if the nursing mother would forget her infant, I would not forget you. Of course we know a nursing mother can never forget her infant because she hurts. Like she's in pain if she's not nursing her infant for too long. And so, you know, that would never happen. And then extending that metaphor to distance from us, like it's painful to God. 
that he would constantly be reminded of our distance when we're not close. Like, it's so powerful. Because he has something to give, right? Mm -hmm. Like the, the distance is painful because he has this gift. I mean, if we're going to use the metaphor of milk, but he has this gift of nourishment to give us. All he wants to do is literally hurt his body to pour out into us. Mm hmm ourselves from that and he has to experience the pain of not being able to give us things like mm -hmm. that's crazy that we haven't drawn on that enough in the church i you know the scene with um kristen and she's on the pilgrimage and so mm -hmm. is engorged with milk for nakave who's on her back so by the time she get there she's just overflowing and all she wants to do is lay before the cross and pray and yet she has to like nurse this infant mm -hmm. but it, in some ways it becomes part of the spiritual process like to actually give of herself to this child is the same thing that spiritually she's trying to do mm -hmm. and yeah. what a testament to the idea of vocation that our vocation every christian's vocation is to order all things towards god and that entails the love we give to the people he's placed in our life and so for Kristen as a mother, stopping to nurse her child, even, even so that she can't pray yet the way she wants to pray, is the way that she's supposed to pour forth pour her love to practice, um, which I think is so relatable to any mom who's ever been like, I would just like to get up before my kids one day and pray before people are climbing on me. And to actually get to the point where, well, maybe my path of holiness is accepting mm -hmm. that that's not in the cards for me right now. Okay. You know, that, that my prayer is going to be lived out differently. Um, I think is, that's an interesting, and I think vocation comes up again and again, both in Kristen and then the different priests that she's close to and Lovren's where he had that, um, kind of struggle about whether he was going to join the priesthood or not and chose to live in the world, but wanting to be a holy man in the world. Like that idea of our vocation to love in different situations, I think keeps coming up. Well, and I think that's one of her questions later in the, in the novel when she's talking with Dunolf is, you know, how does she, how does she stay in this marriage when she realized that her lust for Erland is what has led her away from, from the church and from all these good things. Like, so she can't really keep herself from him because it's her husband now. Like, what does this look like mm -hmm. in this state? I, I also wanted, so I want to talk about vocation, but I wanted to show you this quote and now I can't remember. So I'm going to have to just like quote it loosely that asceticism that is compulsory can do more good for us than the one that we voluntarily enter into. And so you don't get to pick your cross. That's actually better for you. Mm -hmm. Yes. You said it in a more simple way than she did. But, <laughs> but I, I, I think that's a really great idea for most of us to consider. And I had a, um, a friend who was talking, we were talking about this being in quarantine, why it is so hard to practice virtue in quarantine, because we didn't, we can't control the situation. Mm hmm Mm -hmm. It's much easier when you're choosing what it is that you're going to give up or you're choosing what you're letting go of. But when suddenly everything that you wanted, it's imposed upon you to give up, mm -hmm. feel heavier cross or a worse burden. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, that's so true. I feel like in my life, I'm constantly coming up against this thought of like, well, I didn't sign up for this. <laughs> As if like I am even capable of controlling like these major things that happen in life that are disappointments or that are frustrations. And it's like, well, of course I didn't sign up for this. It's just life. It just happened. And yeah. now I need to like embrace it, whatever it is. I can't control it. But it's just always funny to me where I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, of course you didn't sign up for this. You don't get to sign up for things. Like that isn't a thing. <laughs> No, but it's the humility of realizing that there's only certain moments that actually grant you the humility to memorize. Yes. And I think, I think that's one of the reasons I love, I love reading Kristen's story too, is just her revelations and how they come. Like you said, sometimes they're really frustrating, but other times it's just reminiscent of what I do in my own life. Like 
She Mm -hmm. knows the stories of the gospel. She lives by the church calendar. She understands what her father wants for her. And when she realizes the consequences by the experience instead of through the cognition. Yes. Yes. Those are the moments for me where I'm like, oh, right. Right. Like I've got, Mm -hmm. I got to have her experience that helped me realize something I already knew cognitively. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think it's also helpful reading it through the perspective of a parent because she talks about how Lovren's he wanted to pick out the sort of man who would pick up any pebble in her way off of the path, like just make everything so easy for her, which is what like we all want. We're like, no, like I have to prepare you to make all these good decisions. So nothing will ever, you won't screw anything up. You won't suffer. You won't be miserable. And then remembering like, that isn't our job. Like we don't get to make those decisions for our kids, which is so terrifying. Like, well, like it's, it's crazy. It's terrifying. And at the same time, what you just made me think of, would Kristen have gotten to the beautiful ending that she gets to? Where she is able to pour herself out for the people who are dying around her, where she's able to just let go of all of her selfish desires had she married Simon, you know? Right, or if she hadn't had the model of Lovren's still Mm -hmm. there, you know, even though she didn't listen to him, even though she did the opposite of what he said and shamed him and brought misery upon everyone she knew, Mm -hmm. that in the end, like, I don't know, I was just, this just flashed in my head, the part where he runs in to save things in the church that's burning down and he pulls out the crucifix. And so when she looks at Lovren's and he's holding Christ on the cross, Mm -hmm. something about their expressions connected in her mind. And she was, she saw this connection between the sacrificial, painful, excruciating love of Christ on the cross with the love that her father had for her. And then I think about what she does in the end where she's like basically running into the flames. Like she is running into the flames of this terrible plague, knowing I'm probably going to die here, but retrieving Christ and someone else, like giving them that dignity and that sacrificial love that we're supposed to give to other human beings because Christ dwells in their hearts and souls. And so it's like, she does, she does model. She does become the person that Lovren wanted her to be. She just had to do it the long way, you know? Um, And I think it's just so hard for us as parents to accept that maybe our kids are going to take the long way and there isn't a lot we can do about it. And that's the nature of, God's love for us as well, you know, that he lets us take the long way. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's a, I just, yeah, it's a great book from every perspective. You know, when you read it as a young person or you read it as a wife or read it as a parent, it's, it's just, oh, it's just so good. I could just, I could talk about Kristen all day. <laughs> Well, we'll, we'll end on that uh, laudatory remark, but I feel feel the same way. And I'm I'm glad to hear you say that it's for everyone because I really do think that it is for everyone. And I don't know why more people are reading it. So hopefully as we celebrate like her centenary this next year, more people are going to read it. Yeah. Yeah. I hope so. Well, I appreciate you doing this. Take care. Bye. Bye.